everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to the Bamboo Ridge Issue 115 reading. Uh, glad all of you are here at Leeward Community College. And uh, this issue is edited by Kathy Song and Donald Carrera Ching, uh, who's here. I would like to introduce uh, one of the editors, uh, Donald Carrera Ching, uh, who edited this beautiful edition, uh, was born and raised uh, in Kahalu'u and graduated with his MA in Creative Writing from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. His short stories and poetry have appeared in local, national, and international publications. His debut novel, Between Sky and Sea, A Family Struggle, was published in December 2015 by Bamboo Ridge Press. He is currently working on a second novel, Who You Know, and a collection of short stories. He is recipient of the Cades Award for Literature. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you folks for joining us today to celebrate the newest issue of Bamboo Ridge. Uh, when Bamboo Ridge was first formed in 1978, it was a time when there was a lack of representation in literature, in mainstream media, and especially in the university. Uh, 41 years later, much has changed. And I think that change is evident in the voices that you're going to hear from today, um, as well as in the pages of 115. Of course, there remains uh, a, still a need for new voices and for us to support those voices. So I hope uh, you will write, you will submit. We do have a special issue coming up that we can maybe talk about uh, towards the end. Um, attend readings like this, and please pick up a copy if you are interested. Because in order to ensure the voices of Hawaii's communities are heard, we need to make sure that we engage, that we read, and that we listen. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce our first author. Elmer Omar Boscos Pizzo author of the poetry collection Leaving Our Shadows Behind Us comes from a family of farmers, teachers, and religious leaders in La Union, Loco Sur, and Pagasinan, the Philippines. Hope I said that correctly. Yeah. <laughs> he graduated uh, from Banguat State University uh, with a degree in agriculture and went to work in the Middle East as a greenhouse agriculturalist. His book includes poems about his experiences as a migrant worker there, especially the abusive and cruel conditions he and his coworkers encountered. Pisa was a Philippines and Poetry Fellow at the Vermont Studio Center in February 26, uh, 2006 and is a resident of Eva Beach in Hawaii. His debut collection of poetry, uh, Leaving Our Shadows Behind Us, was published by Bamboo Ridge in 2019. Elmer? Thank you, sir. Good morning. I, I want to thank you all for coming today, this morning, um, Madam Ann. Thank you very much, Sir Donald, Stacey's, Wang Tech, and all of you here, and for the crew recording us today. I, I have a, this Living Our Shadows, my first debut collection. It's about domestic violence, child abuse, and overseas Filipino workers' abuse in the Philippines, and my stay here in Hawaii, and in some of them in Washington. Um, I have only one short poem here in the issue 115, so I want to share this with you. This is about math, math problems. Um, I, I had, but uh, before that, I want to share you with you a very funny story here that I experienced when uh, in 2007, I was an inspector for Department of Health here, Vector Control. And then uh, our forklift driver was always absent. So my boss sent me for training here. My first day, I banged all the drums and all the cones. So I was sent home, sent back home. And then the instructor told me that I might kill somebody. So it's better not for me to come back when I'm driving the forklift. That's all. <laughs> so here, math problems. Omar Philippos, look at the board for what is given. Four minus one equals three. Prove it in a real life situation. I hesitate. 
4 minus 1 equals 3. Sir, it's my dog, Bornocchio, lifting up his left hind leg to take, to take his time-honored pee. You got that? Okay. Solve the problem on the board, Omar Filippos. I stand hoping to deliver. It's about finding how long a shadow is when cast by a tree at noon. But what business is this of mine? I take too long to answer. In a flash, a three-foot bamboo stick <clears throat> twirls right before my frozen face, and my body stiffens into an exclamation point. He could jab the end of that stick into my ribs. He did that to other students who couldn't get, get their answers straight. Uh, I have only one here, and I want to share probably one here from my collection. Uh, maybe uh, it's about when I was being whipped in Saudi Arabia. Because, uh, um, I was there for 19, I mean, one year, and then the second year, I was there for nine months. For nine months, we were working, and we were not getting paid, and we were abused. You know, we're, not, we're not really being treated fair, and what they did was they let us work 10 hours a day under a very hot sun, burning sun, and sometimes um, they even woke us up at night and let us work, wake up as night, at night and let us work about two to three hours. So, and they fed us fried chicken that were still frozen. When you tore the flesh, blood oozed from that part and it is think the stench is unbearable. So this is the section, the weeping root. Yeah. When I led the strike, I was hauled to a, a jail. The, the calabos they say, and I I was whip every Friday, 25 times in their Chop Chop Square. That's, a, that's like a plaza where all people gathered. Yeah. The weeping rope. The weeping rope, 48 inches in length, is a slender and tapers at the end. But uh-oh, don't ever underestimate its strength. When it strikes its turgid area, all the nerves there lose their throbbing innocence. For almost a year, while we were on 10 hours, six day work week, work weeks in glass greenhouses, we were still waiting for our pay, still eating rotten fish and rice sprinkled with sand. My conscience often spoke to me, forget about working, stand up to the bosses, instead of sulking and grumbling, strike in the watermelons, cucumbers, Tomatoes, cantaloupes, die, so be it. If you are in prison, so be it. Every Friday at 9 a.m. after the Salah, the time for prayers, we prisoners were herded like smelly goats from our holding cells to the main square to take our individual punishments for crimes real or perceived. They had accused us of committing. Mine was real. Fed up with the farm's working conditions, I led a work strike. No one tended to the crops. It was less than a week before all the fruits and vegetables withered. Ten successive lashes crisscrossed my bare back. Each time the weeping rope landed, sometimes striking the bone of one of my shoulder blades, my body shuddered. I clenched and tightened my fists. 
how I wanted to cry and scream, but I knew the Lord was watching. It was disgraceful for him to see me acting like a child. With my hands tied to a black painted four by four by six post, I struggled to stand upright. My tormentor pulled my head up, looked into my eyes with the sharpness of a Henkel's knife. He taunted, oh my boy, how I love your nerves and flesh. They're so tender and supple. I'm working hard on them to make your suffering more unbearable. Be still, 15 more and this will be over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elmer. Visceral, I think that's a, a good way to describe that last poem. Um, our next reader, S. Lucas, was raised in Kapolei and Eva Beach and currently resides in Makakilo. Her writing is inspired by the local experience, experiences of the west side of Oahu. Her first piece, Blazing Youth, functions as commentary on discrimination against Hawaiian adolescents. She works as, as a writing consultant at Leeward Community College and is pursuing a degree in natural sciences. Please welcome. S. Lucas. Can everyone hear me? Now you can, right? <laughs> okay, so I just want to start out by saying that I never intended to read this story aloud, but I'm really happy that you guys are here and that I have been published. Um, like Donald said, I work here, so um, I never really thought that I would get anywhere in my life, so. I'm really grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. <clears throat> in my bio, I put that I wrote this story to function as commentary on discrimination, but really it was just from something that I saw in real life that I didn't agree with, so I decided to write about it. And um, there are a lot of things that I put in this story for characterization, so just kind of bear with me. Um, the story is about three teenage boys, so if you can put yourself in that kind of situation, then this will be a good story. <clears throat> all right. The hotel was a disastrous building not even five minutes away from our school. With only three stories, it was a wonder why we even called it a hotel. But what else did we think it was? It had windows up and down it, mostly broken at that time, dingy beds in every room. We weren't the only kids that came romping through these halls, but we tried to let the other groups know when we were coming so they could stay the hell away. Too many people in one place always attracts cops. Marcus ditched us right after Roxanne left. Halfway down the road, he got a call one of the few calls he received because he was too paranoid to ever make deals over the phone. That fucker made us backtrack to the bus stop where his pack of feral dogs were waiting for him. Fucking show off, lock yourself to the bus stop. Marcus was the most sketchy guy I'd ever met, but that wasn't saying much compared to the company he kept outside of our circle. These were grown men, some in their 20s and one that looked even older and more dangerous than all of them combined. Shoots then, I'll be back with better shit. He hopped on the 41 with the other guys like he owned the whole damn bus, holding his head up high as he followed the group to the back. I couldn't remember a time when Marcus wasn't dealing or fighting. Maybe the only reason I hung around him was because he made me look tougher. In all honesty, I stuck by him because I wanted to be him. Ezekiel, Zach, and I made our way back down the road to the hotel. Zach kept an eye out for any cops or nosy neighbors. Breaking into the buildings in broad daylight was never a great idea, but somehow we seemed to avoid trouble no matter what time we broke in. Regardless, I had an unspoken appreciation for Zach's caution. If it wasn't for him, we'd have gotten arrested a long time ago. We made our way to the front entrance, or the doors that faced the blocked off parking lot. We climbed up onto the roof of the first floor, and then one by one we slipped in through one of the broken windows. Mildew covered the walls of the tiny room with just enough space for a bed in a small closet, and the stench of death hung freshly in the air. We covered our faces and started down the hallway, which was covered in glass and beer cans. I liked the second floor best because it had the only windows you could actually see out of, so we headed up there to escape the chaos. The banyan trees gently danced in the wind, and a bright red cardinal caught my eye as we searched for a room to party in. We found a bed that looked almost decent, and I pulled my flask out ceremoniously as we all relaxed for the first time all day. Fuck school, I shouted before taking a harsh swig of my mom's vodka. I passed the flask around and before long we were all singing and jumping and nothing in the world could bring us down. 
After two hours of drinking and smoking, I decided to call Cherish. It was time for lunch B, her Monday lunchtime. She finally picked up just before her phone went to voicemail. Ranson Kuikini, who do you think you are? I could hear her pouting over the phone, and I couldn't hold back my smile. Cherish, babe, you should come here. Oh my god, are you drunk? Not yet. I started to laugh, but she wasn't having it. Why are you doing this? You should come back to school. Why? For what? I don't know, because you have to graduate. Her voice went up a pitch. She was getting angrier. So maybe you should get your ass back here? Nah, nah, nah. I get one job lined up, you'll see. Uncle was telling me, Kua, you need to graduate. I don't want you to. To what? Silence. To what, Cherish? To what? Girls talking, someone yelling. Was she in the classroom? Babe, you better fucking answer me before I, to hold me back, okay? I don't want you to hold me back. My ears started to ring and I could feel myself sweating, feel my heart pumping blood through my body to make me sweat, feel my heart pumping blood into my head to form curses. I slurred as I clenched my phone. Look at Cherish, I shouted to my boys. Miss Goody Goody over here thinks she's so much better than me. I think you need to get your shit together, cool. Talk to me when you do. I didn't notice that she hung up after that. I kept the phone to my head, barely aware that Zach was calling my name. He was waving the flask at me. Was it empty? I didn't care. I took a swig and found that we had drank over half of it. I stared out the window and into the banyan tree still swaying in the wind. Cherish was everything to me, but all I did was make things hard for her. When Ezekiel got up off the bed, I dumped the rest of the flask on top of it. Whoa, what the fuck, Kua? What? I glared at Ezekiel. He nearly dropped his cigarette before he handed it to me, shaking. You good, Zach asked me. Fuck her already. She wants to dump me, then fuck her. I took a long few drags before I dropped the cigarette onto the bed. Cool. The bed lit up magnificently. Plumes of thick black smoke filled the small room and all three of us rushed to cover our faces. There weren't as many broken windows on the second floor, so the airflow was practically non-existent. The smoke enveloped us completely within minutes. There must have been other shit on the bed that made it light up so well. Someone was dragging me out, but I pushed them firmly away from me. The smoke burned my eyes and lungs. As tears streamed down my face, I tried to pry my eyes apart to see where we were. Ezekiel was gone, but Zach was crouching next to me. I must have pushed him too hard because he was holding his head and leaning down like he was going to puke. More smoke blew into my eyes, and I closed them as tightly as I could while blindly reaching out for Zach. Get out of here, I shouted at him. I felt him dangling in my arms, but I could still hear him coughing so much. He must not have passed out yet. I flung his skinny body over my shoulder and barreled out of the room and down the hall to the window we had broken in through. I could finally see and breathe again once I made it down the hall. I leaned Zach up against the wall and shook him until he started to blink himself awake. Get out the window, now! He was still dizzy, but I pushed him out the window anyway. I broke some of the glass to make it easier for myself to get out. Just when I made it onto the roof, Zach started to droop like he was fainting. In a panic, I grabbed him with both arms, but my balance was lost. We tumbled to the ground with nothing but a kiave shoveling to break our fall. The siren started to get closer. I must have passed out. The first thing that registered in my vision was the smoke spilling out of the broken windows. Blood dripped down my temple, and when I touched the top of my head, I could feel a small bald patch where part of my scalp used to be. Zach lay beside me, eyes closed and limbs flung around unnaturally. He was breathing, so I shook him real hard until he woke up again. We gotta go, get up, run! <clears throat> Zach bolted up, his adrenaline finally kicking in, and we ran like hell down the abandoned road into the new military housing, through the cookie cutter neighborhood, all the way to the closed down hospital. We caught our breath under a monkey pod tree. I tried to listen for the sirens, but they didn't seem to be following us. You didn't leave me, Zach said between wheezing, wheezing breaths. You would have done the same for me. My phone was gone, my flask was gone. But fuck, at least we're alive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you know all the pieces you're going to hear from today. Um, you know, the last piece we read uh, was sort of a reflection and kind of an engagement with um, the everyday and the kind of discrimination and the sort of experiences that we face. Uh, and I think you know even Elmore's piece and what you can hear from from Wing Tech alum are important in that way. A lot of the times we feel like we don't have stories to tell or we don't have a voice. Um, and it's really about sort of accessing that experience and kind of putting it down and, and seeing what you can kind of come up with. And, and only when you actually try and, and give it a chance will you actually come up with you know, something that you know, can really sort of reflect that experience and engage and resist and 
all those kinds of wonderful things. Um, okay, our last reader today is uh, Wing Tech Lum. Wing Tech Lum is a Honolulu businessman and poet. Bamboo Ridge Press has published his two collections of poetry, Expounding the Doubtful Points and The Nanjing Massacre Poems. He is also the Elliot Cades Award winner for literature and one of the original members of Bamboo Ridge Press all the way back in its founding in 1978. Actually not, but it's okay. And I'm actually going to be reading some happy poems. <laughs> um, three poems that I've selected for this morning are somewhat similar. They are all longer poems, all based on my own personal experience, and include a social occasion with others at a dinner party. The first one is entitled Around the Table and describes a gathering of a dozen friends at a single large round table in a Chinese restaurant. S since some of the people mentioned in this poem are based on real life friends, I have omitted any names and just called people A, B, C, D, etc. Around the table. A sits next to B who has arrived early. She feels sorry for him because he does not speak Cantonese and so will sit through the dinner like a deaf person. A knows she must try to be considerate and speak with him occasionally so that he feels included. But she really wants to talk with her friends freely without inhibitions, and that will mean inevitably that she will also join in the wisecracking about B with the others as if he were that there. Everyone gives the menus to C because they know she knows how to order, and anyway, she's picky about her food. Also, they do not want to bother. C, though, calls D over to help choose the dishes, as she does not want to be the solely responsible. In the end, the two settle on the set menu for 10, but doubling up on one of the courses. As the first dish is served, D asks the waitress for extra pairs of chopsticks to serve as communal ones to place on the lazy Susan in the middle so that the people can avoid using the butt end of their own chopsticks to grab additional food. E was brought up to pour tea and make sure to place a pot in front of her. When she pours for her neighbors, they tap their first two fingers on the table as if kowtowing politely to show their appreciation without needing to interrupt their flows of conversation. F stands up when the soup arrives to ladle every bowl. His trick to making sure is everyone gets the same amount is to not fill the first several bowls all the way. It is better to, at the end to top off them if necessary then, than to ladle some of the soup back from those bowls which have too much. G has brought a bottle of wine and has the waiter provide some glasses, but most around the table are not drinkers. A, C, and D want only a few sips, so G ends up finishing off half the bottle by himself. H and I are husband and wife and show up late as usual. The table usually holds 10 comfortably, but everyone thinks nothing of it to move in closer to each other to add two more place settings and the two extra seats. Jay wants to avoid the usual fighting over the bill, so halfway through he excuses himself to go to the bathroom. Discreetly on the way, he passes the credit card to the cashier. However, he is told that a K upon his arrival has already beat him to it. Luckily, Jay knows the cashier and convinces her to let him pay instead. I notices that G is very quiet, not participating in any of the conversations. Concerned that perhaps he feels left out, she makes it a point to serve him second portions without even asking. G in turn nods his head each time in acknowledgement. L keeps looking over at F. She finds him attractive, but she also notices that when she steals him a look, he is sometimes looking back at her. This embarrasses her because it makes her feel like she got caught, although secretly she hopes that it perhaps also means he is interested in her. H often gets too excited at dinners, wanting to speak and eat at the same time. E is sitting opposite him and has to see H talking with his mouth open, still full of food. He tr she tries to avert her eyes, but for the whole meal, feels uncomfortable nonetheless. 
At the end of the meal, the cashier returns Kay's card, loudly apologizing that Jade had told her to do so. The table erupts into a round of protests, groaning and pointing fingers at Jay. So C, who is Jay's wife, has him relent. They have B calculate how much each one's share is and then act as banker to make change and collect their cash. Everyone leaves together, exchanging goodbyes and waves. At the front door, Elle bumps into her eldest aunt, who is pleasantly surprised and asks her niece how she is doing. It is a standard Cantonese greeting that literally means, have you eaten yet? Okay. My second poem <coughs> is entitled At the Wedding Banquet, but actually it's about my wife and me and how different we are in our strategies for how to feast at a buffet. I think all of you have gone to buffets and each of you has developed your own game plan as to how to maximize your food enjoyment. So this is entitled at the wedding banquet. <clears throat> her plate is so sparse, I say to her out loud, <clears throat> big mistake. She glowers, irked at being interrupted while enjoying her eating. But really, yes, there are some small mounds of masculine greens and spoons of hamashi, the crab meat salad and a ginger chicken. But even so, I still spy several spots of vacant real estate all because she likes to keep her foods orderly and distinct. She sniffs at my direction, what a bozo, and looks down at my plate insinuating that it is all a barbaric mess. What I see, on the contrary, is a topographer's delight, a masterpiece of hills and valleys, of seafood risotto, fried chicken wings, a lollipop of lamb, smoked salmon with capers, dollops of potato salad, and a blood selection of tomatoes the melding of the hot and the cold, the sweet and the savory, flora and fauna, some old favorites and some new dishes, all gathered from my initial foray, the medley of small servings on my big platter, which, if they turn out tasting good enough, will warrant a second, uh, getting a second targeted helping. Tonight's the best of. Who cares if my sushi has soaked up a little thousand island dressing or that the pearl onions and duck confit now mingle with mint jelly. I know there are a few disappointments like the asparagus stems that have turned out tough to chew, meaning that I will leave them on my plate to be bust away, <coughs> a small waste. Yes, in Cantonese, it is nan foot to jot, eyes wide, but snup stomach ma narrow, but no one gets to eat a buffet every day. Really though, the bigger waste would be tonight to stand in line like so many times, unnecessarily, like Miss Neat and Clean here, smartly telling me that only when she wants to eat the hot food will she get up to get it hot. In fact, at other receptions, if the banquet room is too chilly, she may just start at the entree line first, only visiting the cold dishes on her next round. I shake my head. No wonder she is a slow eater. Too much appreciation for too little variety. By the time I finish off my hot fudge sundae with extra cherries, she is still savoring her sea bass and rice. And it will be a while before she will sample the dessert bar for some papaya or creme brulee or maybe the just made hot malasadas filled with lilikoi or haupia. Anyway, by this time I am already stuffed and turning mellower by the minute. I guess I do not have to be so worried anymore about missing out on the all you can eat. Instead, I will just wait for her to finish, as I always do, patiently, sated, smug in my digestion. My last poem is based on a real-life experience of our daughter getting married a few years ago. So for this, for this poem, I tried to write down as faithfully as I could all the things that actually happened. It's called Wedding Day. My mother said by tradition she should formally leave from our front door for the ceremony, so she brings back a bag with what she needs to stay with us overnight. Since, there are three uncles, uh, since her three uncles are sleeping in her old room, she shares the downstairs library with her aunt. Cheekily, she suggests we close our bedroom windows so she cannot hear our snores. I wake up early as usual, going through my exercises, eating breakfast and showering. It is still dark. The, draw, the dawn must break before anyone else stirs. 
During the morning, we work on our last minute cleaning since we will have a lot of visitors and a photographer will be taking candids around the house. The coordinator drops off the lay and flowers coming in through the back gate, which the yardmen have left open. I am startled by this. Since I have some free time, I study the four page printout of the schedule for the day. Everything is planned out without much for my wife and me to do. Near lunchtime, I pick up for everyone the sandwiches already on order. I am the last to choose and eat one with ground beef, which is surprisingly tasty. After lunch, a woman arrives to help with hair and makeup. My wife turns out better than I thought it would, her face, especially her forehead, for some reason reminding me of a pearl. She also makes up our daughter, conservatively, with no heavy rouge or lipstick, with no black eyeliner, though later on I overhear others ask about her long, false eyelashes. Close cast classmates show up to help with her dress. Although I brought it in, this is the first time I see it out of its bag. It is a strapless gown that reaches to the ground. It looks just right on her. The photographer takes our pictures of, of, the, fo of the girls and our family. Whenever I am in the group, I try to lean in or tilt my head towards the other, but she keeps telling me I have to smile. It takes me no time to dress my, back, my black pants, my white long sleeve shirt, and my bright red tie, which I brag to everyone is the one I wore when we got married. Our daughter leaves with her classmates. I rented a van to carry my wife and her siblings. As we get into our cars, the twins standing at their window across the street wave at our procession. At the park up on the mountain, the couple need to take more photos. My wife especially likes it when he looks down at the view while she approaches from behind, and then she turns around for their first look. Eventually, everyone leaves to go to the ceremony site near a tree higher up. My wife and I stay behind with our daughter so we can escort her. I take note of two mosquito bites on her bare back, but say nothing. Hidden from view, we have a far distance to walk to the waiting guests. Everyone is watching, making me nervous. When we arrive, she hugs each of us in turn. I turn the wrong way to, and bump into her. We stand to the side of the circle of guests, not front and center. All I can see is her back for the whole ceremony. I am disappointed that we cannot see her face, but I rationalize our guests can, which is good. The officiant speaks through a smartphone, which is hooked up to a small speaker box. They pass it around so that each shares in their vows. Their words are soft, but earnest and clear. After the ceremony, the groom's father and I follow the newlyweds, talking about how, after so many years, it is about time. I utter the words, finally, making sure that both of them can hear. All of us walk down to the clearing for a group photo. Then we disperse in cars and in shuttle buses to the restaurant to meet up again to celebrate what we have witnessed, what they have done. During the cocktails, sushi is served. As I mingle about, I notice the young women helping at the reception table. I bring each a plate of food while we all wait for dinner to start. Before the dinner, my daughter dances a hula in her long gown. The groom, however, sits off to the side. Just, I keep thinking he will join in with her, but he just watches. This dance is for him. The lobster is nicely presented, but when I cut into it, it seems like my knife is too dull. Later on, my wife agrees that hers was overcooked too. It is too bad. I want everything to be perfect. I make it a point to stop at each table of relatives and friends to say at least a little something to those I know. The dinner is not for me, but I still feel responsible. At the tea pouring, I make loud slurps, exclaiming to everyone that this is the most delicious drink I have ever had. I raise my cup bottoms up to show that I have downed it all. The dessert line has three kinds of mochi ice cream. I want to try each one, but worry that they will run out, so instead I take only two. It is time to go, and we help taking home all of their gifts. We say our goodbyes to everyone. The new wife and husband and their friends are still dancing. Their night is still young. In the open courtyard, I look up at the sky, its air crisp after the storm of the days before. The partial moon, two-thirds obscure, beams a bright crescent, a smile to share our joy. Thank you.
so much. A lot of great readings. Uh, now we want to switch off to the question and answer section. Uh, any uh, questions for our writers here? How would, um, if all of you, um, each of you could uh, describe your writing process? I know we have a lot of creative writers in the room. Uh, how would you describe, uh, well, what helps, with, helps you with that spark? Or if everyone could answer that question. Um, my writing process is unstructured. It's called catch as catch can. It means that sometimes I'm reading something and I get an idea and it's a, there's a hook to it, and I say, oh, this is pretty interesting, and maybe I can think of writing something about it, and that's about it. Either that, or I'm driving in a car, and I'm thinking some, about something, or I, I'm taking a shower, and I'm thinking about something, and I say, oh, this is a pretty interesting thought. Maybe I can convert it into a, a, a poem or, or, or an idea. So my, I don't have a journal. I, maybe this is not for the your professors to hear, but I don't keep a journal, and I don't um, uh, write uh, faithfully for an hour every morning, something like that, but it's more catch as catch can. I also don't keep a journal. <laughs> um, my writing process is, it starts with a dialogue, and then it'll kind of trigger a scene and then I'll just kind of go with that scene until I'm done writing and then I take a break and I'll come back to it later um, just to kind of get a full rounded idea so that's generally my process but um, lots and lots of editing lots of it um, I don't have any creative writing degree um, I didn't I didn't really wanted to write I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this. I'm a wood carver. I like wood carving in wood. But then I went through a lot of cruel circumstances in my life. So to describe it in an imagery, it's less just like um, peeling through a layer of onion, the layers. And it makes me cry when I remember all those cruel stuff. And I don't know why sometimes, and I keep on peeling the layers until nothing is left. That's how I write. And sometimes it's like building a nest like a bird, word by word, piece by piece. Then I come back to it, do it again, leave, do it again, come back again. So my, 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 probably this is an advice if you're, now it's starting to write, just write whatever you can, whatever you have in your mind, I, either good or bad, it's up to you. Then build up on those and your experiences, incorporate them, observe everything. This is your professor here and there. So, and, and eventually you'll be writing something that sticks to you and then when you share it, yeah, and people accept, then maybe it's self-fulfillment and self-fulfilling and gratifying too. And then you publish, like it's Daisy, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful feeling. Thank you. Um, I, I think I write to engage with the world. Um, when I first started out writing, I didn't think I could be a writer. I, I was writing because I was interested in, in, in a book I was reading, and I kind of wanted to write something similar to that. Um, and I took a, writing, a creative writing class, and it completely destroyed me and completely destroyed my idea of what writing was and what was required of writing. And from there, I kind of started building up, um, just kind of using my own personal experiences and what I was seeing in the world and what I was encountering um, and trying to make, use writing as a way to make sense of that. And I think, you know, when we're talking about sort of writing advice, you know, writing what you know, writing what you see, making sure, you know, if something's odd or catches your attention or something, you know, engages you, sort of put it down on, on paper. 
Um, and I think that's that's really what where my writing probably comes from is just the world and seeing something and trying to make sense of it the best I can. Because a lot of the stuff that's happening around us, especially now in our you know our current sort of climate that we're in, um, there's a lot of stuff that you know we have these kinds of reactions to, um, and writing can be a tool for you to explore um, what's happening around you, um, and maybe come to some kind of sort of epiphany perhaps, or maybe not, maybe not, but that's okay too. Any, any more questions? Yes. You guys kind of answered the question with uh, the process of writing, but I was just wondering, uh, how do you deal with writer's block? Is there anything that you guys do to um, overcome that challenge? <clears throat> Again, I think... Um, my style of writing is, if I get an idea, I try to go with it. If it's not a great idea, I'll run out of gas pretty soon. And so I would probably encounter this writer's block pretty quickly. And if that happens, then, well, it was a nice idea, but I'll put it away. Um, so sometimes you gotta live with failure and say, you know, it was a good idea, but I can't carry it through. At other times, though, I, I can honestly say <clears throat> that I have tried to put it aside and then go back to it, and I found something else, that another idea that built on the first idea. And then uh, I said, oh, this is pretty neat, so I try to carry it forward again. And I surprised myself that there is this, this uh, new revelation of what was going on. And it may be I have another idea, and then another idea, and another idea. So it comes out to be uh, a, a longer piece. And what happens, I think, is uh, that if I look back, my first idea maybe disappeared, and I got some, something better with the other ideas that cascaded on it. So you never can tell. I think you sometimes you have to put it away and say, you know, ran out of gas. And other times you just try to pick it up again and you'll find that you f something really neat turn, uh, came out of it. For me, it really helps to get out, honestly. Um, I think what you guys have been hearing today is that we all use our real experiences to go off of our writing. Rather than trying to kind of escape from what's going on, we want to confront it, we want to engage it. So take breaks, um, think about what's important to you, what makes you angry, what makes you happy, and you know, tell everyone about it, describe it, you know, put it into a story. But at the end of the day, for me, what helps is just to get out and kind of experience the world and absorb it and then take it with me later. All I can say is don't force it. Don't squeeze your brain. If you know, you're facing writer's block, accept it. Don't write anything. Then as Sir Wang Tech said and Stacy, just go out and, and come back to it and later on, if not, tear your paper down. I mean, just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, 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 don't give up. <laughs> just, just, just write Nike. Just do it. Um, I think it helps to approach it from a different angle. If you're starting to feel like that uh, resistance, I think that Wing Tech and, and Stacy and Elmer are talking about, it helps to maybe think about, well, okay, maybe I'm not, maybe it's not working to put the character in this room with this, this particular, in this particular scene. Maybe I'll try to put them just past that scene or, or try something a little bit different or approach it from a different point of view. Um, and that might help to approach it from a different angle because that might help to unlock what you're trying to essentially get to. Because sometimes we can get hung up on a sentence or on a description or on something that we're trying to just kind of get exactly right when really that little thing is a small detail that just trying to get you to the more important thing you're trying to get to. Um, but I think another thing too that you know, I think everyone's kind of mentioning as well is that sometimes it just doesn't work. 
and sometimes you do need don't throw it away but put it to the side and maybe you know you'll start to write something else and you'll find a, a use for that thing somewhere else or you'll find the thing that you need um, sometimes I can write a short story and get it published in three weeks sometimes it takes me three years um, sometimes I don't do anything with that story and it becomes a scene in something bigger yeah that's kind of just the writing process I think Any questions? Anyone has? Um, I have a question for you. Yes, yes. For the other way. Okay. I'm not going to answer the question, but you can. Um, yeah. How do you how do you folks go about um, revising or editing? What, how do you decide what to add or change or delete uh, when you are writing something, or when you get to that point where you've got something whole and you're trying to get it to be better? I suppose. <clears throat> Again, it's not clear to me when uh, a piece, a, a poem, is really doing well or uh, it's finished or whatever. I just kind of keep going forward. And I, I may have an idea. I may even have, in some cases, a general ending that I think I want to end up with something, some kind of conclusion. And so I have to get from A to B and it has to go through C, D, and E. Um, so it, it, it depends on the, on, uh, the situation. Um, I think, for instance, it can give you an, as, as, as an example the wedding day poem that I just read. Obviously, there was a beginning, there's a middle, and then there was an end. So I kind of was able to flesh out, oh, this is going to happen at the beginning of the, of the day, and then what's happening in our home, and then there's the, the wedding part of it, and then there's the, the wedding reception at the end, and then we leave at the end of the night. So I had a road map, but I had to flesh it in, and um, it took me a while to do that because I, I added stuff in and it didn't turn, turn out to be too good, but then I, I remembered other things that happened on that, on that day, and I was able to uh, luckily fill, fill some pukas in. So. I think it just depends on on your luck and being able to uh, uh, fill in the pukas as to what um, as to what you want to try to accomplish. At least for me, with that with respect to that particular poem. I think that when I was first starting, I was really afraid to edit. I wanted to just get it out and it be done in like two drafts, you know, just I'm over it already. But um, like I said, taking breaks is good, but um, reading it over and over again and making sure that you're not breaking from character, that you're not leaving any holes in the scene, those are things that you just kind of have to accept in the editing processes. They're going to be there. There's no way you can cover all your bases in the first run, you know. So... I think a lot of it is just being kinder to yourself in terms of revising and then understanding your characters and understanding the purpose of your piece and whether you still need things or not. And like Wing said that, you know, you can have an idea of where it wants to end up, but once you get into that character, it can take a totally different direction. And that's, that's my favorite part of writing is just letting it get away from you, that kind of thing. So take breaks, but don't be afraid to go over it over and over and over again. Um, when we were, um, my editors, Christy Passion and Juliet Kuno, were organizing, selecting the poems here, I thought all of them, most of them, were already polished and done. And they were, most of these poems were published by Bamberidge Press. Yeah. And I was so surprised that when these two editors read my poems here, they change a lot. They asked me to change a lot. So I was devastated. I thought that's the best for these poems. But now I learn, what I learn from them is, um, especially the editors, 
there is always the revision process, not only the editing process. And the revision process is so cruel sometimes. They chop your poems. Yeah. Sometimes paragraph, paragraphs, and then you have to rewrite them. And this book took three years to be done. Took three years. From the acceptance to from the acceptance to when it was launched here at LCC, yeah, last April. And your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it like some type of censorship that you had to ed edit? It's not about censorship, mostly. It's about, they say, how the poem will attract to the reader and leave something special to the reader, uh, how it connects to the reader. So they wanted more clarity, actually. Yeah. So that's how it was, and that's how it is. Thank you. Thank you, too. <laughs> you want me to answer my own question? <laughs> you can answer your question. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you have to answer me. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it all it all comes down to the revision and the editing. Um, I, I talk about that. I, I mentioned in the beginning about how I I had that one professor and they completely obliterated and destroyed my idea of what I thought writing entailed. Um, and it was a tough semester. It was a it was a twenty four hour no sleep semester for one one class. And I think what I got out of that class that maybe started with 20, 25 students down to about five students, um, all of them leaving or withdrawing or not showing up because of how intense it was, was the amount of rigor it takes to sort of come out with, with something that you feel is, is done. Um, and you know, that's not everybody's experience, but I think it taught me to be able to edit and revise um, and be able to, I think a really key component, I think Stacy uh, touched on this a bit, is being open to it. So many times we're so close, we just want to be done with it, we think it's done, we think it's, it's complete, maybe we don't want to change anything, but we have to think about our reader, we have to think about what we're trying to communicate, we have to think about what these details signify, um, and you gotta be open to that. And I think that's kind of what I learned in that particular semester, is just being open and being okay that if you change something, if you cut something, if you remove something, that doesn't mean the piece is bad, it just means maybe it didn't need to be there for that particular. Um, section. I think that was really important. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, yeah, just being open to, I think, the idea of changing. Um, and that's really where the story really comes from. Because the first draft, you're just getting the ideas out. It's just getting the story out, getting the idea out, getting it all there. And then it's about shaping. You know, Omer talks about woodworking, and it's very much the same. You have the block of wood. You sculpt it to the point where you think you can kind of see something, and then you have to go through back so many times until you get it into that, that particular shape um, that you want to, to sort of get it into. And sometimes you have to cut off a whole section to get it where you need to be. Sometimes you need to start with a new block of wood. Um, and that's OK, too. Right? Um, and, and also, I, I know that you co-edited this issue. Sure, yeah. Do you have any comments on the process of co-editing? Um, um, <laughs> Now, this is the second the second issue I've done, and I uh, I did this one with Kathy Song, and I'm a I'm a fiction writer. She's a poet. She's she's doing fiction now, as well. Um, I think what's interesting about editing, and I, maybe it communicates too to just the processing process of of looking at the pieces as well, and being a writer is that, you know, sometimes a piece is really gorgeous and really beautiful and really evocative and really makes you sort of think. Um, but sometimes it doesn't make it in as well too, right? And so you know, if you end up getting a rejection or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the piece didn't fit uh, or isn't good. It just means that maybe it didn't work for that particular issue or, or what was trying to be sort of entailed in the editor's mind. Because um, that also comes in terms of audience, right? Um, and you know, at the beginning I mentioned how it's really important to submit and Bamboo Ridge right now has a call for um, pieces that reflect contemporary life in Hawaii. So if you want to write about being LGBTQ plus in Hawaii, um, you want to write about Mauna Kea, you want to write about sort of what gentrification means to you in Eva Beach. Um, this is the next, the next issue is certainly that issue to submit to. Um, 
Yeah, but I, I think that's sort of important to, to write because a lot of the times too, a lot of the pieces that we were getting rid of didn't fit. Um, we'd have somebody writing from New York trying to write about Hawaii um, and have, has never been here, right? So they, they write about it in a particular way. Um, and so that's, that can sometimes be it too. Um, so staying true to your story, staying true to your voice and what you know is also important because that can also affect it. Can, can I add to that too about what you wanted to write? Yeah. Um, there are, as a former inspector, you can write about flies, about insects, everything. No, I'm not kidding. That, that affects us, mosquitoes, rats, stuff like that, and which I did. Yeah. As long as you, you observe their nature and stuff and how they, they affect our lives. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you can make them funny or either make them funny or talk about the diseases they bring and stuff. And that's a piece of literature. Uh, any uh, final question? Any? Oh, yes. This is a question for Don and Stacy. Um, when you have a character in mind when you're writing a story, how do you convey the depths of that character's personality to the reader? What kind of tricks do you use? I think for me, it's about using other characters to show how they would say something, how they would feel about something, and then using scenes in a more conscious way. Um, and what I mean by that is really, don't just put them in a room to put them in a room. Put them in a room because the, that room has a purpose to it. So I think understanding the purpose of the character, it'll just come out kind of naturally once you start writing it. But um, yeah, I think using other characters with dialogue is definitely helpful. Um, and putting scenes that have a purpose in the story rather than just walking them through a room can show things. Um, sentiment. Uh, I think everything on the page should be doing more than one thing. You know, it shouldn't just be a description. It needs to contribute to the theme or it needs to contribute to the character in some way. Um, but I think when you're, you're, yeah, when you're writing a character, the best way to sort of shape the character is through action and through how they interact with others. So often we put our characters in our head and then we'll end up with two pages of exposition of thought. Um, but then when they get into a scene, there's nothing happening there. And it's like, okay, so how is the character being reflected? So I think those interactions are really key and critical. I think you know Stacy was mentioning how when she started out, she starts with a scene, and I think about the the first piece I ever wrote of local literature um, after that class I had taken. Um, it's just two characters uh, sitting at the edge of a cliff, um, about to scatter their brother's ashes, ashes who's just committed suicide. Um, and what inspired that piece was a lot of stuff that was going on in my community. But another part was, could I tell a whole story in just dialogue alone? Um, and so that's kind of what, what sparked the piece. And I think from there, that's how I started to kind of develop maybe some lesser bad habits than, than I had and being able to shape it that way and trim it down and, and get through there. Because that's how you engage the, the reader too, um, as well as give the character. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Oh, wow, thank you so much. Any final thoughts or um, anything that, that you want to say to future writers? I hope that everyone here gets a chance to read my story one day and use it kind of as an example to see that anybody can do it, that it's not impossible to get published. And I would like to be an example for everyone, all the students here, that you, you can do it. And even if somebody tells you you can't, you should just try anyway, because that's what I did. Uh, in addition to what I was, I, I was talking about a while ago, uh, just an example of a very short poem about an insect. This is about the very famous line of Sir Leonard Cohen, you know, the singer, poet, writer, and they considered him a genius. Um, there is a light in everything. I mean, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's his line. And I added to that, Sir Leonard, there is a crack in the wall. That's how the roach gets in. Thank you.
yeah, see, you yeah. can make something out of it. I guess one of the things that has helped me is always to keep reading. Um, it doesn't have to be, it, I, I write poetry, but it doesn't have to be poems. I like to read poems, but I also read a lot of nonfiction, history stuff, things that I'm re doing research on. And that's where I get uh, some inspiration. Um, so I have, I have um, uh, this word of advice. Uh, do not be afraid to steal. Do not be afraid to appropriate material that you're reading or that you have experienced or somebody else has experienced and you've heard of a story of some, somebody uh, encountering something. Appropriate or steal the material and make it your own. I think that that's something that um, I've done hopefully uh, fairly successfully in coming up with a, a, a number of my poems. And I think it, it's, it's being able to be open to, to see, get an inspiration from something that maybe is, to me, out of the ordinary. And I turn it into, into something that um, hopefully uh, I can share with other people as to how special it is. So. Picasso quote, by the way. A bad artist copy, good artist steal. Um, steal in the sense of when you see something that inspires you, borrow it and make it your own. Um, I think context is necessary there. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's good. Um, reading, I think just being open and observant, I think is, is the best way if you want to be a writer. Just watching, you know, seeing something weird, write it down. You observe something, you hear something. Um, Again, that first piece I wrote, um, it was inspired by stuff that was going on in my community, but it was also, you know, every time I, I drove home um, from Kahalu, uh, into Kahalu, we would pass this particular strip of, of the highway um, that, you know, was just guardrail, rocks, and then just water, and then boats all kind of out, and, um, you know, passed that entire strip my whole life. And the thing about that particular strip is that you, you know, you go on the strip and then the road forks and you can kind of go up into Lulani Street, which if you're familiar with Kahlu, Lulani Street is, you know, the two, three, four million dollar houses. And then you, or you could go the other way and that takes you deeper into the heart of Kahlu into a lot of areas that are known for their meth uh, dealings and, and things like that and, and a number of other kind of complications and problems. Um, and so one day we were just kind of driving home from a particular event and we passed that strip one more time and I had a conversation with my wife and I said, you know, like, who, you know, who, who brings their boats out here, especially in such a dangerous sort of area just because, you know, this kind of conflict and contrast and that's where the story came from, just kind of trying to imagine, you know, these two characters on the side of the road looking out at these boats and kind of going from there. And that's, you know, just be observant, look around, watch and see what can kind of come of it. You never know. You know, a termite could be a story. Yeah, I think that. Could. Yeah. Um, I have termite here. <laughs>